either after or during his presentation. After, please. After his <laughs> um, I, for me, it's always important to have more than one sculptor's voice within a classroom, if possible. And that's why I work very hard to bring in guest artists for you folks on a regular basis, because I think you need to hear more than just my voice, um, because I think you get a, a better sense of what people do. And if at all possible, I'd like to introduce as many of you to other sculptors that I know on the other rocks. So we'll continue. I'll hand the floor to Andy. Is your BFA and your MFA is from? Uh, BFA is from Northern Michigan University. The MFA is from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And uh, then I did a year uh, after that at the University of Pennsylvania as a postgraduate student, I guess. And he, you brought a piece over here also? Yeah, that's kind of like. That was stuff that I from that we cast last semester, so okay. that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, okay, I'll will start the presentation. The, in this presentation, I'm going to show a progression of work from undergraduate until now. I attended Northern Michigan University in Marquette, Michigan, and studied sculpture under Dale Weeding. He introduced me to sculpture and to a lot of techniques that I'm still struggling to master. This is a survey of the work I feel that led directly to the forms I work with now. Okay. Uh, bing. This is one of the first pieces of sculpture I made using welded steel wire. There was a huge roll of 12 gauge annealed steel wire in the studio and I was practicing oxyacetylene welding with it. I found that I could do quick three-dimensional sketches easily with the soft wire. This piece was titled Bitch and Stud and I have used the uh, wire like this since then. Uh, horrible slide. Well, visiting my, uh, my vis visiting Dale this past summer, I took a picture of a piece of mine still hanging in the sculpture studio, titled Lover's Leap. It's a nude male and female in free fall. They were originally suspended with springs and placed low enough to the ground so you could bounce them. But, uh, 30 years later, it's still in the sculpture studio, so I'm proud of that. Uh, here's a more monumental piece made from a sheet of scrap steel that circles were cut from and different diameters of steel pipe. I always felt the need to work bigger, but that usually meant too big to move. As well as experimenting with abstract geometric form, I was playing with methods of fabrication and stability of the finished piece. In this case, there was a weak uh, spot across the bottom of the plate that caused some deflection. And that, you know, as I'm playing with this stuff, see how thin the metal is there? When it would sit, it would bend and deflect. So just working bigger, you learn things like that. I took a year or so off between undergraduate and graduate school and started working with more geometric abstract imagery. I made a series of pieces using scrap metal, pipe, and rebar. I submitted this series of work to the University of Michigan and was accepted to the graduate program. Uh, here's an example of the abstract geometric sculpture I created in grad school. Instead of scrap metal, I purchased new sheet metal and pipe and using the shear and the roller available, fashion pieces to sizes and dimensions I felt appropriate. I also introduced color into the work, although I generally stuck with a monochromatic palette. While at Michigan, I met Robert Engman, a visiting artist from University of Pennsylvania, who invited me to Philly to study with him. Engman showed me how to approach abstraction with a more empirically. The piece we're looking at is, is by Bob, it's titled Triune, and it's formed by using three intersecting circles placed on an X, Y, and a Z axis. When I started working with him, I went back to working with wire and started playing with basic shapes centered around three axes of symmetry. Uh, this is where I began to organize space using a more rigorous geometric method. These are some of the small models I made while working with Bob. They're actually two identical forms that fit together to form one. Because of the symmetry within the forms, they were seemingly more, there were more possibilities to explore. I found that by having certain constraints to work within and making subtle changes to each form, that I was developing my own vocabulary of objects. Uh, 
this one has the connective stuff removed. But again, two identical forms were made, fit together and connected in a way that allowed the form to be created. It's messing up. Allowed the form to be created from one continuous line. I'm showing these poor photos of what are essentially rough sketches because these are the genesis of the stuff that I'm creating now. Eventually I started to develop shapes I found pleasing and would come back to the same basic shape and make different pieces using different materials and fabrication techniques. The shape on the left is stacked together on the right to form a column. Eventually, this small model is going to be scaled up to about five feet. And I'll use pipe instead of wire. That's about eight inches long. This is another example of a small shape I found complex and pleasing. It's one continuous ribbon of stainless steel. And it's very symmetrical. Hard to tell from one angle of the slide. I was living in Philadelphia and working with a sculptor named Robin Friedenthal. Robin had early onset Parkinson's, so he hired people like me to make his models and assist in creating his work. This is a section of the shelving in his, in his apartment. There were a lot of people who helped him create very complex geometric sculpture based on the Platonic and Archimedean solids, and this is where I learned solid geometry. This is one of Robin's pieces. Oops. This is one of Robin's pieces, it started as a model, and it scaled up to about 12 feet tall. And here's another large-scale sculpture. This is one of Robin's, and it's on the University of Pennsylvania campus. I found that I could stack the wire together and weld the surface solid. This gave me a nice rigid form with well-defined mass and volume. I started doing this because I wanted to cast work but couldn't afford it. Somewhat ironically, I'm still doing this process but now making a mold and casting it in bronze. One of the things that draws me to this type of work is the immediacy of the process. There are no real mistakes when I work. I rarely redo anything. I bend the wire. I tack the frame together. I stack the wire next to the frame and weld it solid. No going back and grinding, cutting up sections, or remaking new sections. What's created, and it's about as immediate as you can get. With bronze, there are many steps to the process, and it's hard to capture that immediacy. But that's kind of the goal in my latest series of pieces, is to kind of capture the immediacy that I have with the uh, welded wire pieces. Uh, I'm also attracted to symmetry and geometry of three-dimensional space. This is the same shape that is made with itself, pointy in one end, and pointy end in on one form and pointy end out on the other. Uh, that simple act realizes two completely different forms, so different that most people fail to notice how similar they truly are. Here I was working with a geometric shape called an inversion of a sphere, which is a topological exercise of turning a sphere inside out. And here I've created two that join each other about an axis, and you end up with kind of a six-lobed climb model, which is a, a single surface like a uh, Mobius strip, except in three dimensions. And here's the same shape, uh, turned inside out, and I've also finished welding the surface solid. So did you catch that? The first one I connected two together, and this time I turned that whole thing inside out and uh, made this shape. Uh, this illustrates one way I would explore shape and form. Each shape is a series of half arcs. From right to left, I added one arc to the sequence. The right form is a trefoil. I use this shape a lot. The next two have four arcs, but depending on how you assemble them, you get two different shapes. The same with the two on the left, except you get a right-handed and a left-handed version of each when you have five. So it's just demonstrating how I, how I you know, my, my thinking process. 
Uh, this is a shape I've made over and over again, and you can see a larger version of it in the background. Here's another example of welding wire solid in a continuous line to create a geometric form. Uh, this was the unrealistic scale I was working on in Philly. The forms were pretty good, but I had no way of molding and casting anything at the time, let alone at this scale. Uh, this piece was destroyed. Is it plaster on top of water on top? Yeah. Okay. Is it like expanded metal within that also? Uh, like wire, then expanded metal, then plaster? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's another view of it. Uh, here's a form I've been working with over the years. Unfortunately, this was also destroyed. Uh, these black and white photographs were made by a friend of mine, Lawrence Salzman. He's another well-known Philadelphia artist. These were all destroyed. And that's kind of what led me into welding uh, wire solid, because there was a lot of wasted energy and a lot of wasted materials here. You know, again, I was trying to use that immediacy, but uh, wire turns out to be the answer for me to, to work the way I like to work. Uh, I continue to work with the platonic and Archimedean solids and compounds. It's difficult to read this wire work in a static photo, but trust me, there's order and symmetry here somewhere. Uh, this was being shown in Nyack, New York. Just in case you're not familiar with polyhedra, these are some of the platonic and Archimedean solids and duels. Often I'll use these as a starting point for a piece of sculpture. And that's not all. Uh, these are objects based on different polyhedra. I make welded wire frame that is some kind of polyhedral shape, wrap the frame in a framework tube of curved wire, and these were being exhibited in Philadelphia. Here I've connected two of these to create a column. Some of these sh shapes lend themselves to stacking, and a few can be dense packed, and it requires an ungodly amount of time and materials. And at this point, I feel it's best left to computers and 3D printers. It's, it really it's too much. Okay, back to this form I like. I fabricated this a few years ago. It was in the 2007 Delta exhibit. It's made with three quarter inch steel pipe, and it's the same pipe that they use uh, for gas line in your house. Uh, this is a view of a different piece in progress. It has primer on it and no paint. And there it is, freshly painted. Really fresh. And there's another view. This is fabricated using steel pipe as a frame, using foam and fiberglass and Bondo to flesh it out. It took several years of starting and stopping and cutting it apart and redoing it until I got something I was happy with. Uh, it was in the gallery and a light dropped on it, so now it's back in my studio to be reworked. Uh, and that's actually a good thing because there's a few things on the surface and some paint issues that I had with it that I want to redo. But. 